Hi, this is Brother Richard. And today, we're studying the subject, the star group. Now, the star group are a classification of angels by their designation. The scripture reveals that the brightest luminaries in scripture, those that have the greatest glory, are termed stars. In the Hebrew, it's kokab, K-O-K-A-B. And it's designated that way because the scripture is giving us the understanding that these <coughs> have the greatest influence, the greatest glory, the greatest brilliance. And we see an example of that. Turn to Numbers, the 24th chapter, verse 17. background. Here, the prophet Balaam is prophesying the coming of future events dealing with Israel. He's been sent to curse God's people, but instead, as a result of his encountering YHVH, he's blessing <coughs> them. So I'm going to pick it up in verse 17 of chapter 24 of the book of Numbers. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. So he's talking about somebody that he is going to ultimately come in contact with. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. So basically, he's, of course, he's referring to the Lord Jesus in his second coming, in his glory. And in this capacity, he's being referred to as a star because of his brilliance, because of his glory. Hence, those that have the highest brilliance of light are referred to as stars, luminaries. <clears throat> Having set that example, we want to take a look at the scripture as it refers to the star group. Scripture teaches... The dawn stars, which are the elite group of the star group, just as you have archangels, which are the elites of the angelic family, so you have dawn stars, which are the elites of the star family. In other words, they're the brightest of the brightest the God has ever created. Scripture teaches the dawn stars were instrumental in bringing about the construction and maintenance of the physical universe. Turn to Job 38th chapter, verses 4 to 7. <clears throat> Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. So Elohim is the one that initiated the foundations of the Eretz creation. <clears throat> Everything that exists that is supported in the physical, the physical element is held in place by the foundations that Elohim laid. But after he laid the foundations, he turned it over to the dawn star hierarchy. Verse 5. Who hath laid the measures? The word measures there is dimensions. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Talking about the <coughs> measurements of the height, depth, length, and width. The proportions of it. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? 
when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So we see two groups being mentioned as being instrumental in completing the construct that we call the physical universe. Now we want to break this down. Yes. At that time, <coughs> who would have been the sons of God? Since, if I understood this correctly, there wouldn't have been any man. So, apart from Jesus, who else? Because it's using sons plural. Who else? Yes, would have been? these are angels, not humans. The word sons comes from a Hebrew term, ben, which means builder. Excellent. That's an enlightening. Thank you. So, which answers my question is. Well, I already knew the answer. Mm. Of the two groups, which one is the higher one? Well, the builders are the lower. Yes, I see that. I see that. It's interesting. Okay. It gets even more interesting. <coughs> Do we find <coughs> the dawn stars laid the dimensions and gave them to the sons of God to construct? So the dawn stars laid out all the dimensions of the Eretz region, which they received from the architect <coughs> Elyon, and then they determined from the blueprints. It's the same way we do it in this, this realm. The architect gives it to the engineer, the engineer lays out the blueprints, and then he gives it to the construction crew. We see Throughout the scripture, the dawn star group in this capacity. Turn to Revelation, the 10th chapter, verse 1. <clears throat> so since the dawn stars were not the actual architects, and Elion was, uh, Elohim was, excuse me. How would you describe them? They're not the builders, are they? What, what, what's what's the, the, the head? Who's above the builder and the construction crew, engineer. but below but below the architect? The engineer. The engineers, right. So that's how you describe the Dawn Stars. Would you agree with that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, position 10. Engineers. Revelation 10, verse 1. And that's another mighty angel. I want you to take note how he's described. Mighty angel. <clears throat> Come down from heaven, clothed the cloud, with a rainbow was upon his head. His face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. So we're establishing beyond a doubt this is a dawn star. Right. We want that to be noted. But is it YHVH? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's the group YHVH. Mm -hmm. yeah. Notice it says another mighty Yeah, that's why talking right. about. That's why I said a group. Right, group, right. Yes. Now, just again, yes. for my understanding, sure. we, we're looking at the engineers. Just a small aside, it strikes me that uh, the movie, that science fiction movie, Prometheus, refers to the engineers. That's, that's another story, I'm sorry. I that's couldn't. interesting. <laughs> you know, it's, it's quite, it's quite uh, yes. clued in. Yes. Um, we're talking about, is it YHVH or is it another? We know, we understand it's another. Now, what are the differences, if any, between YHVH and other members of his particular category? No None whatsoever. No Why was he chosen then? He is an elite. There's more than one. So when we say, why is YHVH the god of this earth, are we actually saying the group called YHVH are the gods plural of this earth because there's more than one? Is that what Plurality, yes. yes. That's interesting. Because one talks about the other. That is interesting because you see that opens up a whole new area. Yes. I think I'm going to take up our hour. With just questions, so you have to forgive me. <laughs> so when Moses was taken through the desert, mm -hmm. pillar of fire at night, and at during the day, the, the cloud is, it, is it the same one angel, or is it the group? It's the one. It's the one out of the group. So it's not any. It's not any. It's not uh, different ones doing shifts, for example. No. no. How, how do we know that? Because the way the father assigns. 
category uh, of ministries to them. Each mm -hmm. one has a responsibility right. that he carries out. But there's only a lead. There may, there may be three or four of them at the most. So during the Exodus, all three, four, all four of them were involved. I think only one was involved, but there were others in the back. Even White's VH was involved. I mean, uh, Elohim was involved because it says he followed them. White's VH led them. But the actuality of the individual who is in the prominence of the activity is one individual. So, based on that, it could be that YHVH led them and another Dawnstar followed them. How do we know it was definitely, you know, um, because it says himself? that rock that followed them was Christ. Right. Elohim, <clears throat> Elohim is in the background because his plan is taking place. YHVH doesn't know the significance of Elohim's plan. But he does know that he's being followed by you know, oh, yes. the being Christ oh, yes. at yes. that particular time. Yes. Would you, would you, would you, and I know this is looking at it from a, a human perspective, but would you characterize it as Christ being the rock at that time wants to make sure his plan is carried out? Or does he have total faith in? Because one presumes he's got total faith and belief in in YHVH. Oh yes, yeah, sure. So does. why why do we why does he need to be there apart from having pleasure from seeing this thing happen? <coughs> because YHVH doesn't know the totality of his plan. But no, no, but nobody else does either. So, or unless you're introducing the concept that the enemy may have something to do with this, no. or may or may try and stand against them. No, it's based off what Paul said. That the revelation was hidden from the beginning of the creation. Hmm. Nobody knew. When man fell, YHVH was totally oblivious to what was going on. He didn't have a clue. Does this mean that at that time, Satan himself would not have had a clue? No. He just was there taking advantage of what he thought was an opportunity. So he's an opportunist? Yeah. Seeking who he may devour. I see that. I see that. But it becomes, you know, in, in this setting, you know, it, it becomes a real issue to, 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 to grasp it because you know, this is not everyday stuff. You have to understand. You have to understand. <laughs> I'm doing my best. <laughs> <laughs> Why, uh, uh, Elohim mm. is omniscient. Yeah. So when he moves, it's not just one ramification. He has to be there because... He understands the totality of the ramifications of what's taking place. So he's going to intricately, in certain areas, mm. in other areas, no. Certain areas, there are, as a prominent, things have to be done in a certain way because there are ramifications that take place a million years in the future. No created being has that comprehension. I can only imagine how it must feel. I mean, I, I feel myself to be... Jewish. I feel myself to be a Jew spiritually because I'm here born into it. Well, but to be to have have Jewish blood in my DNA and to have that culture, you know, going through my, my veins, it must be a hard thing to be a Jew today, knowing what's taken place, but not knowing the totality of you know, all all of this stuff because this stuff is only coming out now. The Jewish people today in such ignorance, no, you can't say that. They're oblivious to what's going on. Really? Oh yeah. They're Jesus time. He, he had um, uh, d disdain for the Jewish religion mm -hmm. because it was so broken up by their traditions. Right. He says, you've wrecked the religion mm -hmm. through your tradition. So today, they are in, a, in, a, they're in some ways worse off than the Gentiles. It looks that way. Because they're constricted, just like the Catholics are constricted by the traditions of the elders. Amazing. Forgive me for the uh, no, no, digression. No, 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 no. And the other thing is they're called the chosen people. Exactly. So, and, and yeah. The Gentiles are the chosen. So. I'm not sure I would agree with saying the Gentiles are the chosen, only because we now know that as, way, as far as, you know, Elohim looks at it, there is no Jew or Gentile. There is no male or female. There is no bond or free. That's why I wrote Paul. So I don't, I'm not entirely sure that he looks at the Gentiles as being eternal, chosen. From an eternal perspective. From an eternal perspective. 
we got to do a lesson on it to bring uh, you up to speed. Okay, but from an eternal perspective, why are we having classifications? What, what is the meaning of that? There's obviously because, something I'm missing. Because Elohim's plan for the sons of God started in eternity deals with the inheritance of the whole creation. The specific choosing that God did in Romans 8 and Ephesians 1 were those that would be born as Gentiles under the new covenant. When were you going to tell me this? Huh? When were you going to tell me this? <laughs> well, the other thing You're is, hiding this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> is that it was YHVH that chose the Jews. Yes, that that much I'm aware of, and I, and I, I see we helped me a, a new a whole class, a whole lesson just to handle that. Oh yeah. Because I've got a load of questions regarding that yeah. one. That's well, that one opens up a whole a better realm of things. Yeah. But understanding it, that the, the Jewish people are chosen from a temporal perspective, they only inherit the earth. Interesting. The chosen for that eternal inheritance, a new earth. But the other two, four Gentiles, are going to inherit everything that the Father has. That is a huge concept. Just that tiny little bit of information is huge. Well, not tiny at all. You understand what, what I mean? That's huge. Huge. I think we'll be shut up for a minute. And it's meant, <laughs> it's meant for those that will receive it just exactly the way you did. Wow. Yeah, this thing just gets bigger. This is mind-blowing. It really, it really is. <laughs> but let's go on for please, the news please. track here. <clears throat> Was that the dawn stars were instrumental in bringing about the construction and maintenance of the physical universe, and we said that they continue in this respect. So we're in Revelation, the tenth chapter. Now turn to Revelation, the eleventh chapter, verse one. Okay. <clears throat> Realizing that this is the same angel talking to John, the dawn star leader, YHVH. Verse 11, And there was given me a reed, <clears throat> like unto a rod. This is a measuring uh, device, <clears throat> a measuring rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. In the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. So YHBH is continuing in his administration over the creation. He gives John a measuring rod and instructs him as to what to do with it. Now, he has stated forty and two months, which is three and a half years. And that's a period of time that I presume the Lord loves. What is the relevance of that? First half of the tribulation period. Gotcha. Thank you. But let's go on. All right. Now, we want to make a connection. Now, turn to Exodus, 31st chapter. Exodus <coughs> the second first. Exodus 31st 30 chapter, and when you get there, we'll verses 1 to 11. The principle here is that YHVH directs those that are builders in the use of the dimensions and the implementation of what's being constructed. He's the engineer, and he limits and he defines what is to be constructed. Now, let's take a look at this. <clears throat> They're in the desert, going forth. The Lord spake unto Moses, so this is YHVH, the dawn star leader, spoke unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God. 
in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works to work in gold and in silver and in brass in the cutting of stones to set them in the carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship and I behold I have given him Ahaliob the son of Ahizmach of the tribe of Dan and in the hearts of all that are wise hearted I have put wisdom that they may make all that I have commanded thee the tabernacle of the congregation and the ark of the testimony and the mercy seat that is thereupon and all the furniture of the tabernacle and the table and this furniture and the pure candlestick of all this furniture and the altar of incense the altar of burnt offering and all this furniture and the labor and his foot and the cloths of service and the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office and the anointing oil and the sweet incense for the holy place according to all that I have commanded thee shall they do. So it's YHVH that enables them to have the ability to construct to the requirements of what needs to be constructed. And I believe in this instance the dawn star hierarchy enabled the sons of God to have the ability to construct the physical universe. Mm. Just interestingly, um, chapter 31, Exodus, verse 6, mm -hmm. he says, I have given with him Aholiab. Is he referring to he has invested authority in the sun? Is that, why, is that, what, is that what he's saying? Yeah, he's given a holy job for his uh, assistant. Okay. And he's equipped him to be able to construct what needs ultimately to be going to be given the directions of what to construct. All right. <clears throat> Scripture teaches the star group, now these are the lesser stars, are commissioned to oversee the running of the physical universe. So not only do they oversee the construction of it, they oversee the lesser stars and the other angelic groups. So they belong be below the sons of God. Oh, who? The, you said the star group are lesser stars. The lesser stars than the dawn star. They're right. all the same family, the star group. Gotcha. But the dawn stars oversee the lesser stars who oversee the lesser beings in administering the universe. For ability to try to discern what you just now said, when the beast pulls down the stars... One third of the stars of God are, is he pulling down dawn stars or sons of God? Lower, 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 lower stars. Lower stars. Lower stars. Right. Lower stars. <clears throat> Turn to Psalms 82, verse 1. Here we see an intricate inner view of the way things are run in the universe. Psalms 82 1, God, the word God there is L, standeth in the congregation of the mighty, L, he judgeth among the gods, Elohim, small g, magistrates. Right. <coughs> what we're looking at here. Notice what it says. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. <clears throat> Remember what the angel was described in Revelation 10th chapter. I saw another mighty angel. So the congregation 
which is described as a congregation the size of the north, is run in membership only of Dawn Stars. Hmm. They administer the lesser groups. The Star Group, which I believe do, do not have seats on <coughs> this High Council, but they administer the creation because they've given authority by Elohim, who's given it to YHVH, who gives it to the Star Family. And then they oversee all the others. Is L being used to um, describe the star group, the star family, in time? L is used to describe YHVH, the Dawn Stars. Just, okay, just that. Yeah, notice group. capital G, capital G, small yes. G. Okay. <clears throat> so from the congregation, the, the High Council, and the sides of the North, <clears throat> the Dawn Star group sit, and they survey the whole creation. So is the L group considered, we know El Yon is the most high mm. God, mm -hmm. that's God the Father. Mm. Is L a, a lesser, just like there's stars and then there's down stars? Is that, L applies to the dawn stars. Specifically. Not to anyone above or anyone below, just Well, I would stars. say out of that, because it's, uh, it's uh, describing the position in the hierarchy. Right. L comes out of uh, El Yon, which is the highest, right. L. And then you have just L, which means mighty. Right, powerful. and then Elohim. <laughs> Elohim. But people use the word Elohim when they, or when they actually mean God the Father. God the Father is used, to, that's the term to describe God the Father and God the Son. Yes, and of course, therefore, uh, the Holy Spirit as well. What is the lowest level of being who can be called Elohim? Well, you have men that are called Elohim because they've, they've uh, basically watered it down. The humans don't have any concept of how the Trinity functions. Does that mean you could, you could use the word to describe Moses, for example? Would he be? A magistrate. Yeah, well, the Lord said, I will make you a God to Pharaoh. Small g, right? Small g, right. Small g. Interesting. But what the scripture is giving us is the insight into the original and the true hierarchical designation. The highest is El Yom. Mm. Just below him is <coughs> El Group. Right. And then you have the lower Elohim group, <coughs> which are uh, applies to sons of God, cherubim, seraphim, the lower angelic strata. But Christ and Holy Spirit are actually not part of the L group and are part of the Trinity, which makes... Well, they would be considered L. Oh, really? So El Yon, the highest. Okay, okay. L basically is the, is the highest order in, of that the highest is the Father, who has one designation, El Yon, Most High. Mm. And out of that group, you have Elohim, which is the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, <coughs> designated. Mm -hmm. He's also YHVH, Yahweh, and he's given his name to the Dawn Star hierarchy. Mm -hmm. YHVH. Yes, yes, I get it. They are also called YHVH, Jehovah. Yes. And also L. Yes, but the name is transferable. It's got basically, <clears throat> you have to go by the context of scripture. Because it all goes all the way down to an angel is called YHVH. Right. Because his name has been given right. from YHVH. YHVH. So we should, we should see that, I, wa I want to say it like this without the obvious connotations that YHVH is actually worthy of worship by humans because he's a very serious personage. Oh yeah, he's no punk, as I like to say. <laughs> yeah. Right, he's, oh, yeah. he's, he's you know, really he's serious. A high story, yeah. Now I turn to before we lose sight. Turn to Isaiah fourteen, mm -hmm. and you see the inside of Lucifer's game plan. <laughs> this is a great lesson, <laughs> really. Uh, Isaiah 14, verses 12, down to 14. <clears throat> it 
Okay. Thou art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Thou art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations. He's undermining the Adamic water so that he can cause it to collapse, set up his own water. That's the first phase of his plan. Mm -hmm. Having set up his own order, then he's going to go back into the heavens to reclaim his empire. Now, Son of the Morning, is that a class to which Lucifer belongs? Or is that just it's one a specific name? Applied, a name applied to him. Right, okay. <clears throat> the NIV uh, uses the word Morning Star, which is a total blasphemous att attribution to Lucifer. That's why I don't have anything to do with the NIV. Right. Hasn't Jesus been referred to as a morning star? Sure. Right. The bright morning, bright star. morning star. Right. Yeah. Right. That's what the dawn stars are patterned right. after. Right. Sure. Okay. So I, I, I see exactly what you're saying. Okay. okay. Verse 13. For now I said in <clears> thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. So what he's going to do is he is going to overpower the stars of God and then position himself for ascension into the high council of the dawn star hierarchy. But again, the obvious question has got to be who in the order which is currently above him at that time is going to give, is going to essentially transfer their power so that he can overpower uh, the, the star group. All power comes from one source, the Father. He's going to be allowed to, to do, do that. that. Yes. Right, okay. Part of the Father's master plan. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. The congregation is the high council of the mighty, the L. We just read it in Psalms 82. God standeth in the, uh, in the congregation of the mighty. And it also goes on to say he judges among the small g gods. Now, Lucifer at that time doesn't know, or does he, that God knows all and he's going to be allowed to, you know, to, to carry out his nefarious plan. He knows a certain amount. He knows he's an, he's an opportunist. Yes. He's going to take advantage of the opportunity <clears throat> to do his thing. Okay. And the father's, you know, the father's baiting him. The father's letting him do this because the father has a master plan, and this master plan deals with his, his master plan for the human race. Is by this time is complete. Mm. Sons of God are, are, are just about to be glorified. What he's doing is he's bringing down the other races, bringing them into a state in which they're going to experience. Judgment, second half of the Luciferian revolt. Verse 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. He wants to. That's it. <laughs> he he's not that stupid and he thinks that he can knock it down off of his throne. He wants to function in the same manner as Elion functions. He wants to oversee all things and survey all things and uh, direct and control all things like Elion does. So this is his game plan. Yes. So he's he's mentioning he's gonna rise above the clouds. Why are the clouds significant? Great question. The clouds in the scripture <laughs> deal with many aspects of the creation. When Jesus rose back to heaven, he went back to heaven in a cloud. Beyond the perimeter of the clouds is the high council of the dawn stars. We also know that YHVH was covered in a cloud before he gave the ten commandments. So now, same cloud, same kind of cloud. Revelation 10, 1. Another mighty angel came down clothed in a cloud. Are we to understand from all of this that a cloud is some kind of transportation mechanism, yes. or is there more to it than that? Transportation mechanism. 
it's also a uh, source of power. You can draw power from the clouds. Well, that's another lesson. Bring you up to speed. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you can draw power from the clouds. Yes. Oh, yes. Hmm. Oh, dude, you can't say things like that and then expect me to keep quiet. I'm <laughs> okay. sorry. Is it because clouds are made from vapor, which is water, which is a source by which Lucifer that's goes to a That's where I was going. Clouds the, the are life, the life, storehouses of energy. Hmm. The cloud that was overseeing Israel when they went through the desert, to one it was darkness, to another it was light. It's a storehouse of energy and it's also the ability uh, in it to um, direct the elements. Fire, air, earth, water can come out of the clouds. Uh, yeah, you do a whole You're right. You'll, you'll, you'll that. leave it. But that's, that's fantastic. Thank okay. you. When you leave <coughs> heaven to come back to earth, the second coming, you're going to be coming in a cloud. Anyway. He says, I will sit above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the most high, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So, the scripture is always telling his game plan is going to be fruitful. He will not be successful in dominating the high council <coughs> of the dawn stars. He will be successful in exalting his throne above the stars. Because, turn to Revelation, 12th chapter, verse 4. <coughs> In his tail, which is an assembly of uh, 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 an assembly of followers, the dragon tail forces, those that he has influenced and dominates. His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, those are the star group, and it cast them to the earth, imprisoned them in imprisoned them in the subterranean regions of the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So this is taking place just before the rapture. A quick question, just to put this into perspective for me. Mm -hmm. If Elyon, the father, didn't allow this to happen, mm -hmm. would, the th would, uh, would his tail, the, the, the group of, of uh, passengers who... Uh, who can price his tail, excuse me, would they have naturally, innately, the power to do anything at all to the stars of heaven? No, not at all. They have to be allowed to. Well, this, 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 sounds, this sounds like more than allowed. This sounds like they're being enabled. They're being given the power to do it. <coughs> they are. The Father is going to allow them to overcome a third of the star group. Right, so he's restricting the ability of <coughs> the stars of heaven. By releasing them, they have mass power. They, 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 they focus as a unit. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the Greeks did the same thing. They had the phalanx, yes. which they would focus on the weakest part, and they would just drive a wedge into it. Now, <coughs> um, we're going to see this from an earthly perspective, and it shows you this takes place just before the rapture. Turn to Luke, 21st chapter, verse 25 to 26. <coughs> There shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Now, let's understand something. This happens instantaneously. It is a day in which it starts off, which basically is just another day. People are going about their business, buying, selling, marrying, giving in marriage, doing their thing. And all of a sudden, the universe goes into a convolution. 
because a third of the star group is being attacked by the Dragon Tail forces. And the ramifications come down to Earth as a result of an upheaval that causes all of the planet to go into convulsions, land, sea, and air. Let's to continue. There should be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity to see the waves roaring. They're not going to what, know what's happened. All of a sudden, everything is just going out of kilter. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. The order of the heavens is going to be disrupted because the Luciferians are going to take over, displacing the star group. Right. The star group had <coughs> stability in <coughs> the heavenly regions, celestial regions. The Luciferians are going to cause instability. <coughs> Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. That's the rapture, the appearing of the Lord. Now how long would, would, would you guess between men's hearts failing, in other words, uh, the taking over of Luciferians, to our Lord the Son of Man coming in a cloud of power and great glory? Oh, shucks. Uh, Many years, decades? <laughs> years, minutes. This thing is going to happen instantaneously. So, just to make sure I'm getting this right, at the point that the Luciferians begin to take over, that's when we start to see the signs and the wonders, within minutes of that happening, the Son of Man appears. Yes. Remember mm -hmm. what the scripture says, <clears throat> in such a time as you think not, in the twinkling of an eye, mm -hmm. the change takes place. Look up for your redemption draweth nigh. If you're in the field, don't go back to the house to get your stuff. Right. Just immediately. To get the stuff, right. Absolutely. Yeah. And they're not going to have any time to do anything but get out of there. That's why the scripture tells us you have to be ready because these things are going to happen very, very quickly. <coughs> the Lord descends. The trumpet sounds. Judgment's pronounced. The whole heavens are going into upheaval. People on earth are dropping dead of heart attacks. The change takes place from mortal to immortal in the twinkling of an eye. And then the dead rise, the living are changed instantaneously, and they rise, and this whole thing is over. Right. But then, surely, those who will be taken up by the rapture, I guess it doesn't matter where they are, because that's going to happen right. anyway. So exactly. as long as they don't focus on not being in the rapture... Right. After you open to the spirit, right? The spirit but, will guide and direct. But that makes what I've said makes sense. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. At that point in time, if you're not ready, mm. you're not going. Right. You, it's too late to get ready. Right. Right. That's the point. Because I mean, in other words, we will know because we're invested with the spirit. That's that's what I'm understanding. Exactly. And the spirit yeah. will prepare us because gotcha. the change takes place within you. Yes. You get the fullness of the spirit in a heartbeat. And you're changed. And then when that happens, up you go. Wow. I'm prepared to bet, not that I'm a betting man, that I could ask a hundred pastors that exact question and probably wouldn't get a satisfying answer. No. You can't do something you don't know. Mm. And the other thing is, see, if you don't constantly go to the trough for a fresh drink of water, you're going to rehash the old stuff over and over and over and you're going to hear it by somebody else saying and so you're going to add that in your next sermon and it's going to sound interesting it sounds like you changed it but it's the same thing over and over and over you have to have extra oil right you can't just have the same knowledge. oil you know that's a great point such a great point in fact i'm going to call that a foundational <laughs> point that people really need to grasp because unless they've just grasped the concept that you've you've made pretty clear they're actually not going to know whether they are, are um, rehashing the old stuff or whether you know, they're seeing new revelation knowledge. That's, a, that's a, a huge concept. This whole aspect, most churches believe the rapture is going to be secret. 
Mm. People are suddenly going to disappear, and you'll see clothes laying all over the place, and everybody's going to wonder what took place. Everybody is going to know when it happens, because the heavens will be in convulsions, mm. the trumpet will be pronouncing judgment, the whole earth, the scripture says, this thing is going to come upon the whole world. It says that Jesus descends with a shout. Now, do you suppose anybody's going to hear that? I know I'm going to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> There's not one person that who won't hear exactly, it. exactly. Okay. If it's anything like when so my name not, was called, it's not going to be a yeah. silent rapture, right? How could you teach that? What do you do with that scripture? You know, this Lord descends with a shout, and then the trumps. And it's like sounds like a noisy. <laughs> by the way, it's happening. You know, wake right, up. Right. You know. Right. So if you're not ready, start fleeing. If you're yeah, ready, exactly. just change. And unfortunately, if it happens, and I'm in Jay's house, he's going to say, Smitty, you know, what's going on? And I'm going to say, I'm sorry. I, I've, I've got, got a, to I've got a I train to catch. To pay, <laughs> I've got to go. Pay attention to what's going on. Absolutely. The change is happening. And it's going to be heartbreaking, you know. I don't suspect I'm going to be in his house. Uh, but no, the, I the think point the is taken. Going to have me moved on. I'm, I'm sure the point but, is taken. Long before that. But no, you, you're, you're right because I, I, I like the way you think that. It's pretty clear that we're beginning to understand something that is has been cloaked, if at all. The people doing the cloaking actually knew anything at all, if at all. Hidden in plain sight. Right, but I'm beginning to suspect that the people who should be telling us, you know, the, the ministers in the past, I'm beginning to suspect. Well. I'm sure but they've already, they didn't. No, I don't think they knew. I don't already think they've been to seminary and they got their certification. Yeah, exactly. You can see it hanging that's on the exactly wall. Exactly the point. And so, why do I need to go farther? That's I already exactly know everything. Point. Anyway, so what we find here <clears throat> is an understanding of a revelation that the scripture has been warning about for 2,000 years. Just read, you know, all the person has to do is read the scripture. You don't have to try to get somebody to interpret mm. what the scripture is already saying. Mm. It's repeated in Matthew 24, Luke 21, Luke 17. It, you know, it's pretty concise in what he's saying. The same principle holds true before the rapture and after the rapture. Go to them that have the revelation right so if you apply it before the rapture good chance you're going to make the rapture Absolutely. Right? so Absolutely. you know let's hope that <clears throat> this group right here mm -hmm. is going to be of those of that group i that I, I have no doubt i mean that's what we're, we're doing i mean we are all i think going the extra mile not just to make sure that we ourselves have got the oil but mm -hmm. to try and help others to grasp See, that that's point. exactly what the scripture says you want to be caught teaching. Absolutely. You want to be, when he comes, you want to be in the midst of teaching. Doing what he's told you to do. Yes. Absolutely. Teaching. I, I firmly you don't believe want that's to be on vacation having a Mai Tai <laughs> in, in Bali or, or Hawaii or something, you know. It's, you know, and the whole thing is, is see, I'm not saying that having a Mai Tai is wrong and this right. and the other. I'm right. just saying that if your whole, if your life is other than Christ being the first in your life, yes. then if you're a betting man, you can bet that you're not going. You're not making the rapture. Oh, I've made that Anybody bet. that thinks that way yeah. is not going to make the rapture. You have to make yourself ready, and you have to die to self, eliminate the carnal desires, mm. just replace them with what. Do what Jesus says. Mm. I always do that what pleases the Father. Absolutely. Just be keep that in the foremost of your mind. Every day you wake up and get, get out of bed, try pleasing the Father. Put it foremost in your, in your mind, and then go to the well and get a drink. I love what you're saying. Love what you're saying. That describes um, my attitude. And I've got to be honest with you. It wasn't because I chose that attitude that it had nothing at all to do with it. But it was shown that, you know, that's the right uh, path to take. So what we find it. here, it's going to happen suddenly. And then, 
Those that are left behind are going to realize why they got left behind. And immediately, immediately after that, they're not going to have time to breathe. They're going to be rounded up and hunted down and butchered. Turn to Matthew, 24th chapter. <coughs> Immediately. Now, immediately. immediately means seconds or minutes after those who are in the rapture have left with That's why they told to get out of there. <clears throat> That's just an incredible state of affairs. Incredible. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Verses 8 to 9. It's talking about in verse 7, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. The human race is going to be against, set itself against itself by the Luciferian influence. <clears throat> in verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. This is when Christians turn on each other. Then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. They're not going to have time to breathe. It's going to happen so suddenly. Because Lucifer is coming on the earth in <coughs> setting up his system without any opposition. It's going to sweep over the earth like a flood tide. And of course the main target are going to be Christians. Mm, of course. And that those that are getting those that are left behind are going to be basically <coughs> cannon fodder. Now the reason and another reason we find that it's going to be so quick, they will not have time to do anything but repent. And then immediately they're butchered. And they go up under the altar. Turn to Revelation 6 chapter. Verses 9 to 11. <coughs> When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. The only thing they're going to have the opportunity to do is to declare their commitment to Jesus Christ before they get butchered. Mm. <clears throat> they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, do I <coughs> judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth, the Luciferians? rammed them up and killed them. White robes are given unto every one of them. They came up without robes. They came up naked mm -hmm. because they didn't have time to do works that would repair and give them a covering. They just repented knowing they missed the rapture and oh God, I repent. I'm sorry. And they, you know, you're standing before a Luciferian king and you're given a choice. You, re you repent <clears throat> or you renounce your relationship with that one or you suffer the consequences. And it says they gave their testimony. <coughs> they knew that it was all on them and they knew what would be waiting for them if they didn't. So they take, they bite, <laughs> they bite the bullet and they get martyred. Now, when you say they didn't have time to do their works, let's just bring that down a second. What exactly, why are you using the term works? I'll explain it by scripture. Turn to Revelation, the seventh chapter. Okay. Verse 14 and 15. <clears throat> Great multitude in front of the throne, in front of the altar. Verse 14, I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. He said to me, these are they that came out of great tribulation. This is the next tribulation, second half of the tribulation period. And have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The first group didn't have any robes. Right. The second group had robes because they had time to get their act together 
and do things that would reconstitute their righteousness. After they repented. Okay. Notice what it says. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Notice what it says in verse 11 of chapter 6 of the first group. <coughs> and white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants, also and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. So you see the second group in Revelation 7, the first group in Revelation 6, the first group comes up naked because they got wiped out right after the rapture and uh, <clears throat> didn't have time to make anything, uh, accrue anything to give them a reward. Hmm. You will know, it talks about the second group become priests. They, they, they're, they're put at the altar and they uh, minister to the Lord. It doesn't say anything about the first group. The inference is they're going to wind up on the new earth because they have no position okay. in the kingdom. 